All right, so the first thing to start off with is going to be the domain name service. You'll often see this abbreviated and written out on the exam, at least I'm assuming from all the practice materials, as DNS and domain name service. It'll usually say, like, according to the rules of the DNS, parentheses, domain name service, blah, blah, blah. Here's the thing. Whenever you connect to the Internet, or at least whenever you make a website that's supposed to go on the Internet, you have things called domains. You have something like a, uh, and I'll zoom in on this because it's going to be kind of hard to see otherwise. You have, of course, the top level domain, or what's another top level domain? Or is one, what's another one? Net, um, the, what was it? EDU, perfect. Yeah, all these things are that. And then, in fact, because they opened it up even further, you can actually specify your own. Uh, top-level domain when you make a website now. Uh, the future is here, apparently. But this is all handled with the domain name service because whenever you access a website online, whenever you access a website online, your browser is going to first go to this top-level domain. All of the websites from these domains are stored on certain servers. So it's going to go to that group of servers. And then from there, it's going to try and find the, the next-level domain, which is going to be this part of the URL. It's always that part. For instance, from digitalportfolio.collegeboard.org, College Board is the second level domain. Top level being org, so it goes to the group of org websites, and then it finds College Board inside there. The next thing it does is go to the subdomain, um, if there is one. In this case, there is, which is Digital Portfolio. So your subdomain is basically right to left. Think of it like that. Right to left, from the .com, .org, .edu, right to left is going down each tier. It's going to start at that topmost tier and just keep going down until it finds the particular site you want, and then from there we'll find the right web page. And then lastly is just the hypertext uh, transfer protocol part, but we'll ignore that for now. All right. So yeah, whenever they talk about domain name system, uh, domain, yeah, uh, domain name uh, uh, search, uh, they're talking about how these things are tiered. Your browser connects to this, which then finds this one inside of that one, which then goes into that. Because there are other parts of College Board, like the course audit, AP Central, and uh, students. I think it's probably just one part of the name. Any questions about that? Okay, yeah, not not terribly difficult, just something you have to know. Uh, so digital certificates and trust model. Uh, this is something we talked about. Of course, you guys remember certificate authorities? Yes, no? Okay, uh, I saw at least a few hands nodding and some yeses. Certificate authorities are usually some kind of security expert. They look at your website. They try and decide whether or not your website is like good enough to be considered secure, and that's just through making sure your website has very clean code and good server management. The most you have to know about the exam though is that certificate authorities are security experts who determine if your website is good enough to join HTTPS. Can anyone tell me what HTTPS stands for? Go ahead, sir. Good. Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and then the S stands for, was it? Secure, perfect. Yeah. Uh, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, secure. Once you can join that, that is when you are given your, your digital certificate. Not every website has a digital certificate. Only those on the HTTPS will have them. You will know a website has it because of that HTTPS all the way on the left side of the URL. Uh, oftentimes, also, they'll have that little lock symbol in your browser. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. So that would be up there. And all of that comes to just what we call the trust model. And I'm going to actually resize this just so that way it's better. I don't, I don't like how small that is. All right. So all that ties into what's called the trust model. The trust model is where because the certificate authorities are trusted to be really, really good, websites are fake, 
must are also considered structure and form. So any questions about trust model, digital certificates, um, certificate authorities, or HTTPS? Any at all? All right, perfect. Next up, the IET, uh, the IETF. Some of you on the mock exam are noticing that uh, you are unfamiliar with that. I know you write in the margins, like I don't know if this is or IETF. Look it up later. That is the Internet Engineering Task Force. They're a group of volunteers who are also security and internet experts. They look over the internet. And uh, they decide ab about uh, various protocols. So if you remember us discussing TCP IP and how that was the transmission control protocol and the internet protocol and how that related to packet handling and packet routing, the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, they look over the whole system and they decide what changes should be made. A lot of types of technology, you might have a really good system in place, but it needs a little help uh, getting better. So these guys look over it to make sure that it can work more effectively. Yes? Uh, it will be on your campus, yeah. Yeah, so all the standards for TCP IP are created by the IETF and they continue to work with it. Just a few other things before I go on, are there any questions? That's the bulk of what they'll ask you about for that. Um, otherwise, just want to make sure you remember HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, is uh, how we transmit data. Websites are built with HTML, the Hypertext Markup Language. That is how websites are built. It is not how data is communicated. Addressing, as in how to actually find a person on the Internet, how to actually send them stuff, is what the Internet Protocol addresses, the IP addresses. And all that is under the TCP IP. The TCP IP, the Transmission Control Protocol, also determines what happens when packets arrive out of order. Remember, packets are how data are sent over the internet. So when packets arrive, and you know we get one, three, two, five, well that tells us a few things. One, the receiver who just received it, their TCP stuff is going to look over that and say, okay, let me put this in order. So one. Two, three, five, and then also, hey, I'm missing number four. Can you resend four? So those are the uh, two big things about TCP/IP. Uh, remember that HTTP is how we transmit data. Websites are building are uh, built with HTML. Addressing is with IP addresses. TCP/IP handles um, uh, reorganizing packets and requesting missing ones. We are halfway through. Any questions? Okay, perfect. Latency and bandwidth. We didn't deal with either of these two much in depth, but latency is even what latency is. Alright. Latency is how long it takes for a packet to go from sender to receiver. So if we have from uh, point A to point B, uh, let's do that in white instead of red so you can actually see it. We have point A here, point B over here, and we had to send a packet from one to another. The amount of time in milliseconds <coughs> it takes is what we call the latency. Latency is also called the delay in the amount of time it takes to receive a packet. You might say it's the delay of information re uh, reception. We would say that if we want to be really complex about it, the delay of, air, of data reception. But we could also just call it the number of milliseconds it takes for a packet to go from one place to another, to go from sender to receiver. That is latency. Now, if there's a lot of latency, the packet takes longer, meaning you know it takes a lot of milliseconds, which since each packet is a tiny bit of data, the more milliseconds it takes, the longer it takes for your website or your game to load. 
you often call that lag when it takes a long time to load. So this is what we call latency. Milliseconds it takes from point A to point B for a packet. Yes. Yeah, so latency, milliseconds it takes for a packet to make the trip from sender to receiver, also called delay of receiving data. Oftentimes you hear it talked about when we talk about lag, uh, when there's just a lot of time between sender and receiver, which you know, gets frustrating because the packet's tiny, and the longer it takes, the longer it's going to take for everything to run, whether it be a website or a video game or whatever. Bandwidth is a little different. Uh, bandwidth is uh, where we have and how much information can be handled at a time. Usually you'll hear this in megabits per second or millions of bits per second. So if you imagine ones and zeros going in here, while you might be getting all these sent to your computer, you know, a whole big file is just you know, sitting here ready to be taken in, it's going to be going in into what's called a It's going to take time for it. Whereas, you know, someone might be sending you uh, a large file. Let's say this is our file right here. And it's 100 gigabytes. And your bandwidth is 60 megabits per second. What happens is... You have this 100 gigabyte file, it's a huge file, and where a uh, giga is a thousand megabytes, and a thousand megabytes are a kilobyte, and a thousand kilobytes are, I mean, like one kilobyte is a thousand bytes, and then one byte is eight bits. Yeah. So 100 gigabytes is a very large file. Most of your hard drives in here are, I think, are like 200 gigabytes in total. So you get this gigantic file, it can't fit through this through this uh, entrance, right? This is our bandwidth. This is how wide our data receipt is. And we usually characterize it in number of bits per second. 60 megabits per second is a common um, bandwidth for modern day internet traffic. So that means it could only take 60 megabits at a time. So it's going to take a little while for this 100 gigabyte file to be downloaded into your computer. But that's what bandwidth is. Whereas latency is how long it takes to get here, bandwidth is how much of that data it can actually process at a time. Uh, so the more it's able to process at a time, the faster it will go. Um, but uh, there is, of course, kind of a, what we call a bottleneck to it. It can only process so much. Questions? Okay, yeah. Also, uh, when we discussed DOS and DDoS attacks, which, what did that mean again? Denial of service. Denial of service, yeah. So when you're, when you're overloaded with packets and you don't have enough bandwidth to handle that many packets, that's when the DOS attack lands. So, you know, if you're getting way too much of this, hitting at the same time, then yeah, it, it's going to crash. But otherwise, it's just all bandwidth, how much you can handle at a time. Was going to piece it out. All right, so lastly, let's talk about um, Lastly, let's talk about this. So when it comes to bit representation, uh, we have, of course, bits. Now, bits are called binary digits, right? It's a 0 or a 1. With one bit, you can represent two different numbers, 0 and 1, right? With two bits, you can represent 4, 0, 1, 2, and 3. If we go a bit further, how many numbers can we represent with three bits? Three ones and zeros. How many can, numbers can we actually represent? Tell you the formula in a moment, but for now, you guys have that.
Josh, how did, how did number stand with the team? It is eight. You can represent zero. You can represent uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. That's eight numbers in total. So with three numbers, we can represent uh, the largest number we can represent is seven, and thus we can represent eight different numbers. So everyone good on that? Yeah. This one? Because there are three bits in each place, three bits per day. So we can represent eight numbers with three bits. We have four bits, we can represent how many numbers? What is it? Try again. Wait. Yes, yeah, 16. Sorry, sorry, yeah. 16. So let's talk about that a little bit. Since we can represent 0 through 15, we get 16 different numbers with four bits. Now I'm bringing this up because this is actually a very common question. They're going to give you something like, if we had 28 bits on this server, so we represent 2 to the 28th uh, number of numbers, how many uh, more numbers can we fit with, two to the, with uh, 42 bits? Yeah. That's a 14-bit increase. And you might be wondering, well, how do I do that? It's actually pretty, uh, pretty easy once you know this. What it is, and this is something you should write down, when you move from uh, one number of bits to another, you keep doubling each bit you add on. So if we were to say from three to four bits, we can represent eight more numbers, which is double the number we could before. I'm going to size this a little bit larger. Again, please enjoy the old school RuneScape meme. In the meantime, all right, there we go. All right, so. When we go from 3 to 4 bits, we can represent double the amount of numbers. If we went from 3 to 5 bits, we would double it twice. We could represent 16, I'm uh, sorry, we could represent uh, um, uh, 24 more numbers, which is good because it's just doubling each time. The difference is 2 to the blank. So whenever we move from a certain number of bits to another one, it's 2 to the blank more times because we double each and every time. So because we uh, doubled our capacity for representation twice from three, to five, three bits to five bits, we would say that we would get two to the second more times. So if we were to have a system where we went from, from uh, 28 bits to 42 bits, we could represent two to the 14th more numbers because we would double that many times. And that's really what they're going to ask you. They're not going to ask you what 2 to the 14th is, because that would be ungodly. That would be terrible. That's a big number. It's a gigantic number. And you don't have to calculate. But what they will ask is, this to this, which one of these is it? You can tell me right away 2 to the 14th, because that's how many times we'll double from 28 to 42. You will be asked math equations like, what's 42 minus 28? But they won't ask you what 2 to the 14th is. Are there any questions about bit increases? We'll see a question like that in today's Albert also. All right, then just one last thing. It's about uh, digital access. I just want to make a point about this before we go on. Digital access. And it's just the fact that, um, uh, okay, so not everyone has a computer, right? And in a world where that's uh, increasingly important to have one, there are a number of things that we use to keep people able to access it. Uh, one such example of that is a public library. Public libraries provide computers and internet connection. So if you really don't have access to those things, public libraries are pretty necessary. That is definitely the kind of question that will show up. They'll ask you, what improves digital access to those who are not able to access it? Or they'll mention the digital access gap, which is just simply, you know, who can't really access it. Traditionally, that's usually poor, uh, poor individuals who obviously just don't access the technology, or are living in a poorer area where that technology just isn't accessible. Whenever you go for an internet service provider, it's very regional. 
the, the infrastructure, the wires, have to actually exist in that place in order for you to get internet access. Otherwise, you don't have access. That was one of the big things of the net neutrality argument um, that made those happening on that, because in most places, there's either there's really only one internet service provider who actually put their wires there. Uh, so you really only get one usually. In my area, it's spectrum, period. So we've got about digital access, we want to look at ways of increasing digital access, this class is about that. So things that help, and you might just write these down, because I'm sure you can figure out why, are libraries. Uh, tech classes. Tech community classes meaning uh, those are classes that are available for people in the community, so not just school classes, but classes taught just to the community to help people get access. Um, and those are just, yeah, let's see, those would be some of the big ones. Mobile data, I feel, should also be on this list, but I would hesitate to write that one down. But those are some of the big ones that really make a difference. You might also say uh, digital cafe, though I, have, I I don't think I've ever actually seen one of those. How many of you actually don't know what a digital cafe is just because we don't see it often? At least a few of you. I've said before. Yeah, digital cafe is just where it um, is a, it's a place you can go to access the internet. It's kind of like going to a restaurant that has a uh, Wi-Fi and you ask them for the Wi-Fi password, but the digital digital cafe is just simply for having uh, computer access and internet access. There's there they don't serve you food usually. It's just a computer lab with internet access. Yeah, these sorts of things help. Public Wi-Fi is forced me to go like Taco Bell and ask them for the Wi-Fi password and log in or you register. Any questions about that? If you're all good, go ahead on to um, Albert. Check today's assignment. It's a 6.2.1 exam review. I'll answer any questions you have. Make sure that whenever you miss a problem, you are reviewing it. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. We'll do very good with this.